So it's been the life of sharks and shipwrecks. William Hugh Edwards, usually known as Hugh, born 29733, 83 years ago, Edinburgh, Scotland. At that stage, the war, uh, the U-boat war was in full swing and nobody in their right minds would get on a ship to go to England. So a job came up in Western Australia, a professor of English, and um, he uh, thought, well, we'll go and do that for the, until the war gets over, and then he would go back to England. But in point of fact, um, he never did, and the family has been here ever since. I, wasn't, I was always good at English and history. They were, they were my subjects. And I, I never passed a maths exam in my entire life. Yeah. I went to Howard School for, for a time, and then my father decided that uh, I needed a, what he thought was a better education and sent me across to Geelong Grammar, which I thoroughly disliked because I could only get home for the September holidays and Christmas, so we have a, spe a spell of something like nine months uh, away from home. And um, I was um, a young surfer, and there was no surfer, surfer Geelong, and it was cold. And um, But I spent seven years there, and um, um, my education basically came from the school library. So even though I disliked boarding school, the um, library was very good for what I would do in later years. There were a lot of colonial shipwrecks, and the story of the Batavia and the Gilt Dragon were quite well known. In Western Australia, the um, translation of Pelsart's journals, Pelsart, of course, was the commander of the Batavia, uh, it was brought out in 1890 by Florence Broadhurst. Henrietta Drake Bachman was a great friend of the, the Broadhurst daughters. She stayed with them in Joel at various times, and she became fascinated by the Batavia. When I started on the Daily News, I was a diver, and I'd done stories for Daily News on local shipwrecks at Rottnest, the Macedon and the Denton home. Um, and she would always wind up the night by saying, when are you going to go and find my shipwreck? The cannons that had been seen from the surface were bronze guns, and they um, were green, and when the sun shone on them, they looked like all the gold in the king's counting house, and it was a marvellous wreck. Um, and with the Batova story was the story of the, mass the mutiny and the massacres and people being killed on the island. So could Little Beacon Island with its three crayfishermen's hut be the Batavia's grave out of the old story? And um, so we, on days when it was too rough to dive, we, we dug around on the island and um, doing trenches as I've, been, as I've been taught to do in the Mediterranean. And we found a series of skeletons, um, which included, um, the first one we found had a big sword chop in the top of his head and his throat had been cut so that his jaw was um, disarticulated, as our expedition doctor, Naam Hamson, put it. And so we had sensational stories because we, we had the wreck with its cannons and some coin, and then I'm sure we had the skeletons. And there's never been a better story um, from the adventure point of view than the Batavia. Oh, right, when, when television came to Australia, the, the, the great Australian interest um, always was in sharks. So when we started making underwater movies of the shipwrecks, we also um, made movies of these sharks, and particularly the great white shark, because that's the one that um, uh, is the most, is the largest, the most magnificent, and the most deadly of sharks as far as human beings are concerned. And uh, the cages had big camera gaps, so we get our, ca our camera cameras out, and uh, we filmed sharks very successfully, and for Channel Nine at the time. And so, um, from that, I became interested in sharks as well as shipwrecks. And we studied the sharks, photographed them, and, and um, uh, had the great advantage over other people who were studying sharks in that we were watching them in their own uh, environment. With the filming from cages, 
Um, I don't know that we could have stayed in the cages if we hadn't had the cameras. The, the, the cameras were big and bulky and you could put yourself in between yourself and the shark. Um, because the camera ga had to be big enough to let the camera go out of the cage, the, uh, it was big enough to let the shark's head come in. And so we, we'd get to the stage a couple of times where the, the shark would have its nose in the cage and we'd have to bang it with a camera to get it out.